Um, let's do a bit of podcast cringe. Podcast cringe got a new video out. Dumb and Dumber about Brendan. The cost of stupidity. Let's see what this is about. Let's see what this is about. Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber. Big up podcast cringe. Great channel. You know I love them. Um, the cost of stupidity featuring Brett Crash. Let's call. Let's, let's play this. Uh, You're selling more. No, no. Bigger I mean, no, I mean, I, 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 I should don't shut know. up because no, I love no, no. him and he'll he'll eviscerate me. Probably. No, no. Tom has his. I think his podcast, Your Mom's House, is very right. profitable. I don't think he's touring right now, so it's like it's anytime anyone's touring. I definitely do bigger venues than he does. Oh, really? Yeah, he knows that. Okay, good. The uh, he doesn't. He's done an arena. I do arenas. <laughs> so like, whereas Tom has done an I, arena, uh, one here, he, he's primarily his comfort levels theaters. That's where he really can sell right. tickets. One truck. Yeah, I, even, uh, I I have like five semis and six. three tour buses. Yeah, right, right, right. He has, like, he flies. Yeah, he, he flew uh, yeah. Southwest recently. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Happy New Year to all my regulars. This is my first video back, so I hope it finds you well. And to start off the new year, I'm gonna be breaking down what's going on with Bert Kreischer and Brendan Schaub because I have some new information for you guys that has me pretty confused. I don't know, maybe you guys can make better sense of it than I can. Basically, it looks like Bert has hired some random Indian firm based out of Mumbai to start spamming copyright claims against YouTubers. I've really? received a couple myself, and I have no idea if Bert actually hired. Really? Ah. Huh. Is Bert doing this, or is this somebody trying to make some money? Because that's a bit of a scheme, as all people do, right? Where they file copyright claims and they're not the copyright holder and they just claim they are it's a nice little racket you can do i had these guys to look after his copyright claims or if they're youtube copyright trolls pretending to represent bert to steal ad revenue allegedly on his behalf so i'll show you exactly what's going on there wow. also after making a video a couple of weeks ago covering a recent interview with brendan Schaub, where he claimed to have an ongoing defamation claim in the courts I've since done a bit of digging and made some interesting discoveries, which I'll share with you as well. But here's the bottom line. In my opinion, both Bert Kreischer and Brendan Schaub are slowly going broke. So let me explain exactly what I mean. What? Really? Bert? Brendan, I could see. Bert, I don't think. Bert, I think, makes a lot of money. Huh. And then I'll come back to those two discoveries I just mentioned, and I'll tie it all in for you. I've covered this briefly in a previous video, and it's an ongoing trend within the podcasting industry where a lot. Honestly, why is he wearing a Chelsea shirt? This guy is the most deplorable person when it comes to jerseys. Why did he own a Chelsea shirt? Big up, high def. Appreciate you, brother. Merry New Year! Thanks for all the streams in 2023. Merry New Year to you too, Hi Def. Thank you so much for the super chat, brother. Appreciate you and hope you're doing well. Hope the family's well. Hope you are well and all of those things in between, my good sir. Hope you are feeling amazing, brightly and shining, okay? A lot of shows that blew up during the pandemic are now seeing... Oh yeah, big up Netwatcher. Yeah, I'm going to cover that next next, next um, show. Um, the fucking... Um, Hans Kim versus Rick thing. Yeah, I'll cover it next show. I've been doing a bit of viewing on it. I checked out some clips on the Reddit. It's fucking hilarious. I'll cover it in the next stream. Thank you for the reminder, brother. Thank you for the reminder. Significant declines in viewership and obviously ad revenue. Oh, Let's look at I realize now. Wasn't Brendan wearing that Chelsea jersey because of Christian Pulisic? Was that the reason why? Right? The fucking, you, the, the, the American fucking football player that, that went to Chelsea. That's why he was wearing the fucking Chelsea jersey. Because Christian Pulisic played for them. Cringe. Cringe, bro. He owns a jersey from every fucking team in the world. Even fucking random soccer teams that he has no fucking idea about. Like, oh, God almighty. Yeah, he plays for AC now. Yeah, he's pulling up. He's doing pretty well there as well. Him and Rafael Liao on opposite sides of the flank. This should get you a baker's dozen of tatar tots. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. A <laughs> bacon does some tater tats. Uh, tater tats. Thank you. I'll get myself some tater tats, actually. Thank you so much. <laughs> a baker's dozen of tater tats. Yeah. Now seeing significant declines in viewership and obviously ad revenue. 
Let's look at Bert and Schaub for example. If we start with Bert's 12 latest uploads, in terms of views he got 11k views, 22, 48, 51, 49, 23, 116, 75, 27, 73, 57, and 276. And that's as of the 2nd of January. His subscriber count is sitting at 1.27 million. So on face value, those numbers aren't that bad. I mean, it's hard to get views, right? But his channel is almost 20 years old. That's right, he started his channel way back in 2006. Some of you watching this right now were probably in diapers in 2006. And I'll tell you what, if I was in the business of entertainment for 20 years and my main YouTube channel was struggling to break 50k views on the regular, yeah, I'd say there's a problem. And it's the same for Bupper. On his Fighter and the Kid channel, his regular views sit between 50 and 60k grand views. I don't think that's right though with Bert. I don't think Bert makes a lot of money from his podcasting. I think a lot more money comes from the touring, um, obviously the ads on the podcast, but I don't think he makes a lot of money from like AdSense and shit. That's never been the game. You know? I don't, I don't, I don't know. What do you guys think? There's a pod here with a guy called... Oh, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe he's right, podcast cringe. Because I see Bertcast number 605... It's two. It's a. It's twenty hours ago. Uploaded. It's on five point seven k thousand views only. And he's got one point seven million subscribers. That's not good, is it? Really, to have a podcast that's got only five thousand views and you got one point seven million followers, one point two million followers isn't the greatest. But then the next show underneath it, Hot Sauce, um, is got forty k views. A lot of these guys don't really. A lot of these guys use their podcast as a way to get ads, and that pays the most money. Because it's money you get up front. And we all know from the whole Podcast One controversy, these ad companies pay way too much money to podcasts, right? That's why the podcast probably probably burst, right? This, they're overpaying for shows. They're not receiving anything, um, you know, on the back end in terms of user signups or whatever, discount codes using, whatever it may be. Um, so that's why the fucking market is a bit fucked up. But I think that's the main money earner. I don't think AdSense or that shit has ever been the biggest money owner. I think it's a nice top up if you're able to get, you know, two to five grand a month extra. But I think the main chunk of their money comes from the ads. Liquid Death, Athletic Greens, On It, all these fucking ads and shit are the ones that pay the most. I think so. You've probably also noticed that for both Bert and Schaub, they occasionally have an upload with a couple of hundred thousand views, but that's usually a video that involves a big name that acts as a draw card. And what that tells me is that these guys can't draw in the viewers themselves unless they do something unique, like have a special guest on, for example. To further prove my point here, let's take a look at Theo Vaughn's channel real quick. Yeah, um, Koyla, he's not consistent with the Burtcast, is he? I don't. I think you might be right because I'm looking at the. I'm looking at my phone now. Burtcast six o five has five point seven views. Burtcast six o four twenty three thousand views. The guest there was Gary Gorman. Burtcast six o three with guest Felipe Esparza, Huckleberry Hill, and someone called Regaline Farms fifty three thousand views. Burtcast 602 with Shane Torres, 23,000 views. Burtcast 601 with Heather McMahon, Heather McMahon, McMahon. Um, that one got 27,000 views. Burtcast 600 with Red Rocks, 58. That's pretty decent, don't you think? Again, it's not super consistent. Like Koyla said, it's like two week gaps in between episodes. But for a podcast that doesn't have super popular guests on there and it's kind of inside baseball comedy talk, to get like, there's an episode here with a guy called um, Mike Mike Vicione. I'm assuming he's a very, you know, heads comedian. That's 26,000 views. That's pretty decent, I think. Don't you think so? For somebody that's not super popular. It's Burtcast 597 with Chris DiStefano. That, that, oh, wow. The Chris DiStefano one got... 272,000 views. And then the one with um the one with that kid, what's his name? The oh there's the one here with Trick Daddy got 85,000 views Burt cast. I don't know, I think it's pretty decent. To get anywhere between like 20,000 to 100,000 views for Burt is pretty decent, I think. Sure, he's sitting at almost 2.3 million subscribers, but his podcast regularly goes over the million view mark, and even the episodes where it's just him on his own, they still almost get 500k views. 
And what about Tim Dillon? He's got 583,000 subscribers and he routinely gets well into the 200 to 300k mark. That's a good point. So Bert and Shaub get views around the 1 to 5% mark relative to their subscribers. That is a terrible view to subscriber ratio, especially for two YouTubers who have been doing it for so many years. Now, here's why I think Bert and Shaub have reached a tipping point. This is the punchline. Commentary videos like this one are getting more views than their podcasts. Mm. There are several channels that provide high quality commentary on these guys, like Too Lazy, Comedy Enforcement, Joke World, and don't forget my boy Sewer King, who's on his way up. Shout out to Sewer King, love you, man. Those guys routinely get more views than the actual content they're covering, and think about all those mini documentary channels like Patrick CC, Ghost Gum, Jay Aubrey, Beige Frequency, <laughs> Sunny V2. Some of those guys get millions of views per upload. What about guys like Rogan and Theo Von though? Yeah, but I don't think that's fair though. I think commentary channels kind of fill a void because most people don't want to watch their content. Most people don't want to watch comedians' content and shit. They'd rather have commentary channels or people like me or whatever summarize shit, right? Or maybe just, you know, whatever, re review things. They don't really want to watch things. Like, whenever I try and watch a fucking full T-Fat K show on here, people fucking go crazy to chat. They fucking hate it. They'd rather I just pull the clips or just watch the clips from the T-Fat K Reddit. No one wants to actually watch these sit there and watch their content. So you're always going to get more views because people don't want to watch their content. They just want to laugh at them saying dumb, funny things. So that might be the reason. Again, maybe I'm defending them too much. I don't know. I just don't buy the fact. I, I just don't buy that it's that significant. Their views are down because I think they make a lot more money on ads. And obviously they make, especially in Bert's case, he makes a hell of a lot of money on tours, right? He's always on fucking tour. He's always doing shows somewhere. He's never with his family for the most part. So you'd imagine that makes a lot of money for them. So I don't think they're hurting the way that Podcast Cringe said they're hurting. Maybe they're, obviously their views aren't great compared to maybe Theo, but Theo's also a bit of an outlier, I think. So they will always get more views than commentary videos and mini docos. So that's why when I started receiving copyright claims from some random Indian company I'd never heard of, claiming to be working on behalf of Bert Crusher, it made sense to me, Bert's getting desperate. He's in panic mode. But wait, there's an alternative explanation. So I was chatting to my lawyer earlier today, who's also my best friend, and I was filling him in on the whole Burt Kreischer Matter Entertainment copyright business, and he actually thinks that this rando Indian company are copyright trolls. As in, Burt Kreischer doesn't know who they are, there's no agreement, they basically fish for content they can make copyright claims against, and start stealing ad revenue off channels like mine. Yeah, yeah, now, basically. I don't agree with that, I think Burt is stupid enough to do business with a company like that because his views are falling off and he's bleeding cash every month, but I could be wrong, have a look for yourself, this is their website, these are their three sections, legal, services, and contact. They say, Matter Entertainment is a Mumbai-based entertainment and content company. In our talent management division, we work with leading creative talent across the realms of direction, screenwriting, and publishing to create entertainment for the global Indian audience. In addition to talent management, we offer integrated capabilities of content curation, development, and full-scale production in our producing division. Okay, doesn't mention anything about content management or copyright management. It looks like a production company to me. I even managed to find who founded the company, some guy called Caleb Franklin, who apparently originated from LA, graduated from Harvard, and now he lives in Mumbai. He's got deals with Netflix, Amazon, Sony, Disney+. Plus. So maybe this company is legit. But why did Bert hire an Indian company to steal ad revenue of commentary channels? <laughs> Maybe it was cheaper than using bent pixels like Brendan Schaub or Superbam like Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. both of which are LA-based companies. Anyway, who knows? It all seems so dodgy to me. But let's put some numbers on all of this so we can get a better idea of how much we're talking here. And to do that, we're going to jump over to ex-YMH producer Nadav, who recently jumped ship to start his very own channel. And lucky for us, he's making a series on how podcasts make money. This was from part one just two weeks ago. And for reference, CPM means cost per mille or thousand views. And it's an advertising term used as a rate paid to a content creator for advertising on their website, okay. video or social media account. Uh -huh. So basically, for every thousand views, a creator will get paid a specific CPM rate from the advertiser. 
Let's plug in the numbers for something that's in the entertainment niche. Let's say it's an hour long podcast with a CPM of 50 cents and it has 10,000 views. I just plug that into the old J piano and that comes out to a whopping 50 bucks in YouTube ad revenue. However, let's say a podcast has a CPM of $10 and got 3.6 million views. That comes out to an insane $360,000. Now keep in mind, that's an abnormally high CPM and abnormally high number of views for a podcast. So let's go with the average. Let's say an entertainment podcast has about 150,000 views and a CPM of the average, which is about $2. That comes out to $3,000, and that's a lot more realistic than some of the other numbers I was talking about. Um, hang on a second. Is that right? Let's just double check those numbers. So if I go over to ChatGPT, if a video with a CPM of $10 gets 3.6 million views, how much ad revenue did it make? Do some calculations. The estimated ad revenue for the video with 3.6 million views and a CPM of $10 would be $36,000. <laughs> um, what did Nadav say again? Oh, I... <laughs> That's why you got fired, isn't it? That's why Nadav got fired from your mom's house. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. He carried too many zeros, right? <laughs> Oh, fucking the dog. That's why he got fired, man. Or that's why he had to go. <laughs> However, let's say a podcast has a CPM of $10 and got oh, 3.6 million views. That comes out to an Three, insane $360,000. Huh, not quite. <laughs> 360000 Yo, he thinks like everybody is like a multi-millionaire. <laughs> Holy shit. God almighty. No wonder everybody's shitting that fucking podcast, isn't it? <laughs> Dove, but you were only $324,000 off the mark. Did Tom teach you nothing? Jeez, mate, maybe this will help. Just know that it's your mindset and you're thinking <laughs> like a fucking loser, but you don't have to. You don't. You can change the way you think, but you have to accept the way you're thinking right now is not going to get you anywhere. You're being bitter, you're being petty, you're insecure, you're not confident, and you can change that, but you have to be proactive. <laughs> okay, that was mean. Shout out to Nadav. Maybe just steer clear from talking about numbers altogether. But hey, at least he cleared it up in the comments, right? Hopefully Tom never relied on his numbers when buying all these cars. Anyway, looking at Bird and Shaw... It's a it's an interesting grift, isn't it? Like it's an interesting angle, isn't it? I worked out a podcast. Let me tell you all about the numbers, and then he gets the numbers wrong. <laughs> I worked on a very successful podcast. I know everything that goes on about. I know all the inner workings on that makes a podcast successful. Let me tell you all the inside information that you guys don't know about. All the behind the scenes stuff. First fucking thing he does: guess information wrong. Numbers because they've got brand deals and they do ad reads. I think they're probably working off a CPM in the range of twenty to thirty dollars. So taking their average video of forty to fifty k views, they're looking at anywhere from one thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per video. But if we look at their channels from a top-down view, Bert got around eight hundred thousand views in the last week, which using our CPM of twenty to thirty dollars gets him to around twenty thousand dollars for the week. And for sure, things are looking a little bit worse with just two hundred and fifty k views for the week which would be bringing in around $6,000 for that week. Now, that's a lot of money, right? No arguments there. They're still doing okay. But when you start including their overheads and their expenses, the picture doesn't look so rosy. Shaw has to pay Callan and two producers. He's got to keep the lights on, pay the bills, pay the rent for the studio, etc. Well, he does have to pay George now. He can save some money. He didn't pay George, so he can save some money that way. He does have to pay George, so he can save some money that way. And it's the same for Bert. These guys have full-time staff working for them. They both also have other side gigs, like Bert has Two Bears One Cave with Tom, Shorb has his Thick Boy channel and his new one called Toontown, so I think Bert is still getting by, but Shorb is definitely feeling the heat, in my opinion at least. I'm sure a bunch of you have heard about Bapa's latest fail after he flew out one of his fans to LA and then offered him an internship at Cringe Boy Studios only to apparently let him go because he couldn't afford to pay him. Now, I'm not fully across that situation. All I did was watch Too Lazy's video, so go and check that out if you haven't already. But see, this is what I mean about tough times for Shorb. 
And to make matters worse for him, he recently joined the Podcast One network mm -hmm. after he was apparently scammed out of $1.6 million in unpaid ad revenue from his previous network. But he so did get it back. But he did get it back. He did get it back. That's why he signed with them. Because no one... Need, I kind of got why he signed back with Podcast Cringe. We're sorry, with them, pod, Podcast One. Because nobody else was going to pay him the rates that he was getting. Nobody was probably going to sign him anyway. So he's probably low on options, low on guarantees. So he went with Podcast One because they owed him money. And they paid the money to him, right? They took out a loan with some online Spanish fucking credit um you know um, i forgot was it that payday loan service or something something crazy i remember i read that in the article on the stream and that's how he got his money so he got paid at 1.6 million and obviously he went and bought a car <laughs> right he went and bought a fucking car straight away um but yeah he got paid so it was probably a smart decision to go sign up back up with podcast one actually if you think about it as part of this deal, he supposedly took a bunch of shares in Podcast One, which he was bragging about. If you want to know the details, go and check out my video covering that. But let's check in to see how Bupper's shares in Podcast One are going. They IPO'd in September at $4.39, and now they're trading at, oh wow, $1.86. That's an almost 60% decline in value mighty, over a four-month period. Whoops. You know, I'm a shark when it comes to business. But that's the thing, though. That's the thing that's funny, though. They obviously are doing badly, but he's doing well. That's the thing. He still came up trumps with that because he got the money. He basically was signed up. I forgot what they were called before Podcast One. So he was signed to terms that were crazy favorable to him, not to the company. That company beforehand, they were doing guaranteed minimums, right? Or payouts or whatever it may be, which is fucking crazy. So before you even get fucking ads, they will pay you a certain amount. And they were doing that, obviously, to make sure they get, you know, all the podcasts on their fucking network. Then obviously over time, the ads stopped coming in. They couldn't stop. They couldn't offer the money. They couldn't offer guarantees money. They couldn't keep up the payments. And obviously that's when it started fucking scamming people. But Brendan was owed 1.6 million from them. And he obviously didn't get that for anybody else. So he stuck with them and still got the money. So even though he signed with them and he might have stocks, you know, it involved, you know, interest and shit, he still kind of came out of it smelling like roses because he got the money he's owed and he still has a podcast ad network behind him that he probably wouldn't have got on his own. You know, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to say, but he still did the, I wouldn't say the smart thing, the right thing, not the smart thing, the right thing. Business. They underpaid my man. That a boy B. Just keep moving. Don't stop. Jeez, lucky Toontown's going gangbusters. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, that means the world to me. Thank you. No worries, B. I got you, bro. He, but he, he didn't cry like that about George, did he? He only cries like that about Crystalia and when they made that fake video pretending like, you know, he didn't know he was made about thanking him for putting out Gringo Pappy. Brilliant. You know, you, you get, you commission Chin to make a video for you with all your friends and family thank thanking you for being alive you cry your eyes out but then you don't cry your eyes out when you fire george the sweet innocent boy who didn't deserve to be fired away he good did cold cold world as for bert have i mentioned that he is one of the biggest comedians in the world and regularly sells at arenas and sells millions of dollars in tickets around the world i was talking to a comic the other day and he's like your stage shut up how much does it cost what do you travel with? I travel with five tour buses. I have, it's like 1.7 for a month is what I pay for my state. Like, we're, it's, it's such a huge business that if you're a guy who just wants to make people laugh, you have to, one, negotiate the open mic scene, which is insane. Just getting out of an open mic scene and getting to the next level is crazy. That's like little baby turtles have a better chance making it to the ocean, right. making it to deep water than a stand, than an open micer does getting out of a comedy scene. Then you have to get into the clubs and we haven't even got you into Hollywood yet. Now you got to go to Hollywood and try to pitch a show and see if you're actually likable. I mean, this is, there are so many hurdles to get through that then you go, Oh, you'd got to start a podcast. You got to have a social media presence. You got to have a social media team. Do you have a producer who's doing your content for you? I love how none of this includes being funny. I, ha I love that none of this includes being funny. It's all a big fucking hustle, a racket, a grift of some sort. None of it includes being funny. None of it includes putting on a good show for your fans. It's all just like, how high can I ascend and how much money can I make? It's never about doing actual good work, putting on a fun show. 
making your fans smile i don't know whatever it's just <laughs> it's just how far can i climb up this ladder how much more money can i take up with me how big can my bag get how big of a bag do i need to carry all this motherfucking cash for you oh by the way your digital footprint needs to be this and that's going to cost you ten thousand dollars a month where's that ten thousand dollars from you're not getting it from stand up i mean dude i run a business and i digital footprint what does he pay people to like what digital footprint does he mean like he pay people to make content for him 10 grand a month or does it mean he pays people to like clean up all the shit stuff he says and to put good press stories out there about him 10 honestly if there's any way if there's one way you can scam you can ease a, a aspiring stand-up comedian is somebody that's easily separated from their money in it if you're a scam artist somebody can easily scam our aspiring comedians and aspiring actors because they all think the reason why they haven't made it is because they haven't gamed the system when really it's because they're not good well, really, maybe it's a timing thing or whatever, right? But they all think there's like a clever hack or a trick as to why they aren't getting as much views as they need to get. So if you're a scammer and you set up an agency that is catered around fixing the digital footprint of comedians, you're going to have a queue around the block of people willing to pay you a retainer, right? Or a monthly consultation fee or something. Because they all think it's just it's just this one thing that's gonna change their fortunes. <laughs> oh mate, honestly, they all get I've got a feeling they're all getting scammed by somebody. Everybody's scamming each other. They're scamming the ad networks by inflating their numbers of the, you know, podcasts and what who listens to them and all the fucking audio is king stuff to get good ad monies and shit, you know. The ad guys are, sp are scamming them and they're fucking bored people, they're scamming their fans. You know, everybody's scamming each other. It's all one big racket. And I, I run a fairly successful business, and I am one of the biggest comics in the world. And I'm still going, like, I'm checking, making sure I'm paying my overhead. Like, I, it's crazy. So if you missed it, Bert just said that he has his touring set up, and it costs him around $1.7 million per month. Now, I don't think that includes all the other comedians he has to pay to go on tour with him, and that's Bert's big lie. Sure, he makes big money of selling tickets to his comedy shows, but that's not all his money. I've heard so many different people say that they go to see the other comedians at Burt's shows and when he finally gets up there, it starts clearing out. Now, I don't know if that's true wow. personally, I've never been to a Burt Kreischer comedy show and I never will, but the point I'm trying to make here is that Burt has a big machine behind him and that machine is expensive to run, no pun intended. So, with that in mind, let's move on to Brendan Schaub's law. So is Bert basically paying to hang around with his friends? He's basically paying the priv he's basically paying for the opportunity to be on the road with his comedic friends and not be at home with his family. He'd rather be with the boys. So he constructs this whole elaborate tour thing to do all these shows. They don't really make much money, but he doesn't care because he likes to hang so much. Because I could see that to be true. I could I could make I could see it to be a possibility where Bert is willing just to make enough to, you know, break even, but he more likes to hang. He more likes to go to shows, get all the adoration from fans, get all that dopamine hit, right? Be able to drink and hang out with his fans, do shots, take off his t-shirt. That makes some sort of sense, isn't it? Like, I just want to hang out with my, you know? Fuck, bro lawsuit and follow up from the last video because it's relevant to Bert's new Indian partnership that I spoke about earlier. So yeah, what else are you can do? Stop? Quit? No, no, that's not me. That's not never going to happen. But have you done anything to try to like, um, like suppress this or like get on top of it? Like it's just... What do you... I mean, no, there's nothing you can do. I mean, can, can you sue people? I don't... Have you tried doing any of that? No, I mean, we got we, we have a lawsuit with a guy who made like 3,000 videos. Again, if you're going to critique... <laughs> he made 3,000 videos. I wonder how much videos, podcasts, cringe, these channels are going to end up making in the end. I wonder how many videos they end up, they're going to end up making in the end. like Because it spawned a whole entire fucking economy and industry around him. That one lawsuit was one of the worst moves Brendan could have ever made. 
He tries to say it in a mocking term. Oh, they made, he made 3,000 videos. It's like, yeah, but you fucking suing him also like launched the careers of 3,000 more channels. It's like, you fucking shot yourself in the foot, mate. Um, Coyle is saying, a few people in the comments of that video said that they walked out of his shows. Okay. But I don't know. Actually, just, does, Brett, does Bert do a lot of shows on his own? Or are all of these shows like where he has like other people performing as well? He, he does tour in his, his own a lot, doesn't he? He does do so his own show. So I don't know. I've not really heard him saying he's struggling to sell tickets and stuff. I don't know. Maybe they're onto something, but I don't think it's as fraught as he's making it seem. I don't think it's as he's that down bad, really, to be fair. I still think he's still got a really crazy fan base because he still sells quite a few tickets. Um, but yeah, but he probably enjoys the hang a lot. And he just wants to you know, pay his friends to hang out with him. Stand up or my fight picks or my, whatever, my football picks, all good. That's what the internet's for. Now, if you're going to go out there in uh, defamation, like, you know, whatever, Brendan hits his kids or beats his wife, oh. well, then you got my attention, I'm going to come go after you. Oh, Yeah, that, that game I don't play. And the guy's suffering from that. So that is whatever. But, you know, the internet's always going to internet. There's nothing you can do to combat that. But... Okay, so after I made my previous video on Bapa's interview with Joel on the Hot Breath Comedy Network, I tried to see if I could find the lawsuit that Brendan was talking about in that interview. And so I spent hours trawling through the various courts trying to find his defamation case that Shorb said he had going against the guy who, in Shorb's own words, made defamatory statements about his wife and kids. Except I couldn't find it. All I found was a copyright case Brendan has going against a YouTuber, but I couldn't find the defamation case he was talking about. Now, I'm assuming that after being involved in a legal battle against a YouTuber, Brendan knows the difference between a defamation case and a copyright case. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here and assume that he must have a defamation case in the works. Maybe he just hasn't filed it yet. Who knows? There are myriad possibilities as to why I couldn't find a current defamation action from Brendan Schaub. So because I'll just have to take- Because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. His word for it and wait for more information to become publicly available. But I will say this, and I'm going to speak in general terms here because there's a broader point to all of this outside of the whole Brendan Schaub situation. In the US, there are specific provisions that safeguard against copyright claims when a copyright holder disagrees or has hurt feelings from the critique or commentary another individual makes to a US-based audience. If you want to look it up yourself, it's Title 17, United States Code, Section 512, Subsection F, which is a subsection of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, commonly referred to as the DMCA. So you've probably heard people talk about a DMCA takedown. However, in the context of this subsection, a false claim refers to a knowingly material misrepresentation that material or activity is infringing. So let me just break this down. What does that mean in the real world? Well, if a copyright owner sends a DMCA takedown notice to YouTube claiming that a particular video is infringing on their original work, but that claim is false or fraudulent, then the alleged infringer can sue the copyright owner for damages under 512F. Now, to be successful on a Section 512F claim, the plaintiff must prove that the false copyright claim was made with actual knowledge that the claim was false. Okay, now we're getting to the juicy bit. So, I don't think this would ever happen because Joe Rogan's a big boy with bigger things to do, but let's look at a completely hypothetical situation where he's scrolling through YouTube and he finds a video that says he's the worst comedian alive, he's not funny, he's also a midget, he looks like a thumb. <laughs> and in that video, they use a couple of clips from JRE to explain why they think those things about him are true. Now, He's not happy about that. So he jumps on his computer, he emails his minions at Superbam, the company that manages Rogan's content, and he says in this email, I'm so sick of these guys making fun of me. I've had it. I want you to take this video down and shut them up. I don't ever want to see a video like this using my content again. So Joe's angry, right? I hope I've conveyed that well. His minions follow their orders and they go through the process on YouTube's backend and make a DMCA takedown of that video. Say this particular YouTuber isn't scared of bullies and knows a thing or two about US copyright law and decides, you know what? This was fair use of those JRE clips. I'm gonna sue him for taking my video down because I make a living from these videos. So they eventually end up in court and they get to this thing called discovery. 
This is my favorite part of legal disputes because effectively each party gets access to any materials from the other side. So we're talking like text messages, emails, yeah. meeting notes yeah. that contain certain key words that are relevant to the case so that they can assist the court in making a determination. Mm -hmm. Everything eventually comes out, right? Mm -hmm. Now, remember that hypothetical email that Angry Joe sent to his minions at Superbam? Yeah, that hypothetical email would now become evidence, and in my opinion, based off my experience in these cases as well as my reading of Section 512F, that constitutes actual knowledge that the claim was false because it had nothing to do with copyright. It was simply a public figure trying to silence someone else's criticism of them hurt. because it hurt their feelings. Okay. That's why I'm assuming that when Brendan Shaw went and did that interview, he said all that stuff about a defamation case going because someone said nasty stuff about his wife and kids. I think he was actually talking about a defamation case because if he was talking about a copyright case, in my opinion, that would have to be the single most stupid thing an individual in his position could do because, again, this is just my opinion, a court could potentially infer from those public statements that a copyright action wasn't really a copyright action. It was simply an attempt to silence criticism, however vile and unwarranted that criticism might be. It might look like he had actual knowledge that the copyright claim was false. That's why I'm holding out for this defamation case, because there's no way someone with such expensive lawyers two years into a legal battle could be that stupid. And I'm being 100% serious. I honestly think there has to be another case. Stupidity of that. I don't think so, though. I, I, I don't think um, maybe Podcast Cruise hasn't got enough experience or doesn't know enough about Brendan. But I honestly think there is no defamation case. I think Brendan was conflating or was purposely misleading um the you know the reason why he fucking sued unique he's basically trying to make it seem like that but he is that redacted that he would incorrectly describe it as a fucking defamation case and obviously open himself up to more issues in the courts because he's obviously suing unique for copyright infringement or whatever it may be but he's then trying to make it seem like it's defamation at the same point which obviously it isn't so um yeah brendan is that dumb brendan is that stupid unfortunately and um yeah he's probably gonna pay for it in the end because you probably gonna win that case that magnitude is simply not feasible for somebody in his position. The only other thing I can think of is maybe he meant to say he has a bad case of inflammation but got his words mixed up. Who knows? But that's why I'm concerned for Bert, you see. I feel like Bert is going down that same road but for slightly different reasons. His expenses are piling up. His revenue is falling. Now he's got this random Indian company. Sorry, I find this so funny. So he's got this random Indian company trying to claw back ad revenue from other channels that are using his clips fairly as per the DMCA. And look, he'll get away with it for the most part, but there's going to be that one channel, that one guy, similar to the hypothetical Rogan example that says, hang on, he can't be doing this. He's infringing on my legal right to fair use because fair use is a legal right. It's not a legal defense. There's a difference. Hence why a copyright owner can be liable for damages in the absence of any economic loss. But look, don't worry about that. I'm probably nerding out too much. The bottom line is, for slightly different reasons, Bird and Schaub are on their way out. And when you put midwits like this in a corner, they start scraping the barrel and they end up accelerating their own downfall. And all their advisors and handlers are probably happy <laughs> to just take their money until it runs out. So they're surrounded by a bunch of yes men who do whatever they want them to and then desert them when it all runs out. Anyway, that's my breakdown of dumb, dumber and dumberer. I think they're not going to ever fall fall flat on their face. I think Brendan has always got Rogan in his corner. I think most people have surmised, myself included, that Rogan has always felt secretly guilty about making Brendan quit the UFC. And ever since then, he's made it his mission to make sure that Brendan never falls on his, you know, on his face. And he's always there to support him, even though they've kind of, you know, they've kind of drifted apart and they're maybe not as close as they once were. He always still has him on his show. 
He always still talks well about him when his name comes up and shit. He's kind of always kind of loyal to him in that respect. So, you know, even though he's maybe not got him on the comedy mothership and shit, their relationship still maintains because he feels a sense of, he kind of feels like he's almost obliged or he has almost a sense of responsibility to look after Brendan because he obviously basically, um, you know, encouraged him to quit the UFC and maybe that kind of changed the course of his career. Bloody blah, blah, blah. And when it comes to Burt, he also comes from a family with money. He's also got friends with money and shit. He'll be fine, you know? I don't think it's ever going to get that bad for either of them. I think they've both been almost grandfathered in. They have the kind of Joe Rogan protection, which counts for a lot, which is why they all suck him off so much because basically with Joe Rogan, it means you can never fail um, because he's always, especially if you're sweet with him, he's always going to make sure he can prop you up and get you on his show to kind of get more eyes and ears back on your side of things. He probably helps people with deals behind the scenes and shit. So I think those guys will be okay. Yes, will they die a death a thousand cuts by seeing their channels slowly but surely die in terms of views over the years cool but it'll still be worth it'll still be a, enough of a vi it'll still be enough of a vi bit viable business for them to turn up every day and collect the ad revenue money from and the ads they get money from as well because like i said i think a lot of those pods they're not really done with the intention of trying to create fun shows for the fans they usually do those podcasts as an opportunity to just squeeze more money out automatically get more money right to use them as leverages or as guys keep platforms to you know stick ads on and shit it's not really as a fun show so i think they'll learn their feet and they'll be perfectly okay but very informative video from podcast cringe appreciate him for doing all this shit very detailed very thorough and obviously his knowledge and his experience being an actual legit lawyer plays a lot into some of the information that he talks about and how detailed and how thorough he is with the things that he talks about so i always appreciate that so big up podcast cringe always incredible always detailed check out his channel you know where it's at you know where that bad boy is at <laughs>